good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, the preliminary results of our randomized study, cardioneural ablation for reflex syncope, uh, interim analysis of a randomized trial. So let's get to the point. Generally, the central nervous system is connected to various peripheral organs. Uh, in many places, we can modulate the sympathetic and parasympathetic part of autonomic nervous system and uh, affect various cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac diseases, such as uh, vasovagal syncope, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, heart failure, or hypertension. Uh, the ganglionate plexi ablation is our special area of interest because uh, GP ablation uh, may eliminate parasympathetic hyperactivity and prevent syncope, functional bradycardia, atrioventricular block, or vagally mediated atrial fibrillation. Uh, going forward, there are some facts about vasovagal syncope. So, uh, vasovagal syncope is the most common cause of a transient loss of consciousness. Usually, the patient with vasovagal syncope uh, have poor quality of life and high risk of syncope-related injury. One of the postulated mechanisms uh, of vasovagal syncope is parasympathetic hyperactivity, which may cause bradycardia uh, or asystole, and the syncope as a final result. Uh, typical treatment for vasovagal syncope is often ineffective. Uh, in our opinion, the pacemaker implantation, especially in young people, should be avoided. And the new hope is cardioneural ablation, um, uh, quite new and promising uh, method of the treatment of vasovagal syncope, because cardioneural ablation may eliminate hyperactivity vagal tone and prevent asystole and syncope. Uh, the history um, of cardioneural ablation began in 2005 when Professor Pachon published first article about cardioneural ablation. So from this time, the data showing the efficacy of cardioneural ablation are still growing. And this data showed that the efficiency of cardioneural ablation is about uh, 90%. However, uh, despite uh, this still growing data, uh, the cardioneural ablation does not have any class of recommendation according to the American and European guidelines. Uh, the reasons for this are weak uh, rationale of cardioneural ablation, small population of study groups, weak documentation of follow-up results, procedural risk, and lack of the control group. So uh, at that moment, uh, the current evidence uh, for cardioneural ablation is still insufficient uh, to confirm uh, efficacy of cardiac vagal denervation. But uh, taking this into account, in, in our center, we decide to uh, create and conduct and randomized trial comparing the effectiveness of cardioneural ablation with a control group. Uh, the study protocol was approved by a local ethics committee and the study protocol was registered in the uh, clinical trial database. Uh, the patients uh, were randomized into two groups, the cardioneural ablation groups and the control groups. Uh, the patients from the first groups uh, were treated by cardioneural ablation, um, while the patients from the control group were treated with standard non-pharmacological methods. And the two-year follow-up was planned. Uh, in our study, uh, the inclusion criteria were at least one documented spontaneous vasovagal syncope during preceding 12 months. Uh, in case of lack of ECG documentation during spontaneous syncope, at least three seconds of asystole due to sinus arrest or atrioventricular block with syncope, or bradycardia under 40 beats per minute with syncope during baseline yield test. Uh, another inclusion criteria were sinus rhythm during ECG and tilt test, uh, significantly decreased quality of light due to syncope, positive response to atropine challenge, uh, it means increased heart rate over 30% after atropine injection, and informed written informed consent. Uh, 
at the exclusion criteria in this study were other possible and treatable causes of syncope, such as significant uh, cardiac disease, cardiac arrhythmia, or abnormalities of vertebral basilar arteries. Uh, the another exclusion criteria were history of stroke or TIA, history of cardiac surgery, contraindication to ablation in the right or left atrium, and lack of response to atropine. Uh, during this study, our approach um, included uh, anatomical ablation uh, combined uh, with fragmented electrogram uh, ablation uh, and uh, the R RF application uh, were done in right anterior GP and right inferior GP in right and left uh, atrium. And uh, during this study, the acute endpoints were defined as uh, increased uh, heart rate over 30% and uh, the presence of vagal response during RF application. Uh, the another uh, acute endpoints uh, was improvement of electrophysiological parameters uh, such as uh, AH interval, effective refractory period, atrioventricular node, sinus node recovery time, corrected sinus node recovery time, and Benkebach point. Uh, and uh, this uh, improvement of uh, electrophysiological parameter were also taken into account. However, the value of cutoff point is not well defined yet. And the uh, last uh, acute endpoint uh, after cardioneuroablation uh, was. Uh, response uh, of heart rate after atropine injection. So af after cardioneural ablation, the increase of heart rate uh, after atropine injection should not exceed uh, 10%. And uh, here uh, you can see uh, on the left, you can see uh, our typical uh, carto map after cardioneural ablation. Uh, on the left, you can see left and right atrium, uh, the green dot show uh, RF application in right anterior GP and right inferior GP uh, from the uh, left atrium and the um, pink dot show uh, RF application uh, in right anterior GP from the right atrium. And on the right, you can see a uh, typical ice image uh, during uh, ablation right inferior GP uh, from the left atrium. And on this slide here, you can see uh, a brief clinical characteristics uh, of both groups, cardioneural ablation groups and control groups. Uh, so the numbers of patients uh, in the both groups is the same and is uh, 24. Uh, the mean age uh, in the cardioneural ablation group is uh, 38 and uh, in the control group is 37. Uh, there are no significant differences between gender. Uh, and the mean number of syncope in the preceding 12 months was similar and was uh, free in both groups. And here, uh, as you can see, uh, an example ECG documentation in patient with uh, syncope uh, and uh, recorded asystole. And here you can see 60 second asystole recorded in the Holter ECG during spontaneous vasovagal syncope. Uh, here you can see uh, 44 second asystole during tilt test. And on the right, you can see syncope uh, and atrioventricular block 20, 12 to 1 uh, recorded in ILR. So in our study, uh, the primary endpoint uh, was defined uh, as first syncope recurrence. Mm, uh, currently, uh, the follow-up uh, ranges from 12 to 24 months. Uh, in the Cardioneural ablation group, one patient experienced one syncope, while in the control group, uh, syncope records in 12 patients. So this 12 patient uh, was crossover to cardioneural ablation due to syncope recurrence, and uh, they um, had offered cardioneural ablation, and the cardioneural ablation uh, was uh, performed in this patient. Mm, uh, however, the study is still ongoing, so the final result should be announced uh, in 2022.
and limitation and question because uh, also cardioneuroablation seems to be an effective and safe procedure, uh, but there are still questions uh, that need clarification. So the most important question, uh, which should be clarification, what about placebo effect and do we really need some procedure? So there is not no uh, at this time. However, uh, this should be uh, clarified. Uh, another uh, important question is that the acute endpoints uh, during cardioneuroablation are not well defined. Of course, uh, extra cardiac vagal stimulation um, seems to be a great tool uh, for assessing uh, of effect denervation during cardioneuroablation. However, the another uh, parameters uh, such uh, increased heart rate uh, improvement, EP parameters of uh, fragmented electrogram area ablated uh, should also be helpful during cardioneuroablation. The next question is total denervation uh, during cardioneuroablation is really required. Uh, next, the optimal approach uh, of cardioneuroablation is not established yet. Mm -hmm. And the long-term effectiveness of cardioneuroablation is not known. And also the long-term safety uh, cardioneuroablation is also not known. So without above answer, cardioneuroablation should be still regarded as an experimental procedure. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to thank Professor Kausner and Dr. Dan Wichterle uh, for the joint ablation training in Gochowski Hospital from standard ablation in 2000 uh, to cardioneuroablation in 2019. So uh, with this nice accent, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Greetings to all. I thank my dear friends, Dr. Kautzner and Dr. Wicherle, and the organizers of the Prague Recent 2021 for this remarkable invitation. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. The Prague Recent Congress is one of the biggest worldwide events in electrophysiology and was the first one to promote the cardioneuroblation, including live procedures. Today, we are going to talk about cardioneuroablation for the treatment of neurally mediated syncope. My name is Dr. Pachon, and I am a professor at the University of Sao Paulo and the director of the Arrhythmia Service at the Sao Paulo Heart Hospital. There is nothing to be disclosed by all the authors. There are several types of neuromediated syncopes, such as cardioinhibitory vasovagal syncope, mixed vasovagal syncope, neurogenic ictal bradycardia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, vasodepressor vasovagal syncope. All of these conditions are mediated by intense vagal reflex and or inhibition of the sympathetic drive and can be treated with great success with cardioneuroblation. However, the vasovagal syncope is by far the most common neuromediated syncope. Despite being treated clinically due to a large number of patients, in many cases, it is very serious and requires interventional treatment with a pacemaker or cardioneuroablation. It is caused by a huge cardio inhibition mediated by the pressor receptor reflex. The big challenge is to identify the triggering factors. The most primitive is the reduction in venous return that simulates bleeding and starts in peripheral receptors. However, the reflex can arise from many other centers of the spinal cord, brain stem, midbrain, and cerebral cortex. Unfortunately, the head up tilt test only studies the bleeding simulation mediated by the basal gerish reflex and may not reproduce in many cases. Despite this, the cardioneuroablation uses the head up tilt test and the atropine test as a major allies in the diagnosis and in the follow-up of the patients. Rational of the cardioneuroablation. In the 90s, we observed that the innervation entry in the atrial wall causes uh, some kind of disconnection of the meiosis of the cardiac cells 
giving origin to the atrial fibrillation nest. The ablation of the atrial fibrillation nest causes the two kinds of response. The first result of ablation of the EF nest is that the atrial wall became resistant to reinduction of atrial fibrillation. So there is an increase of the electrical stability of the atrial wall. And also we observed a very important vagal denervation. Here we can see that the SDNN of 130 milliseconds went down to 27 milliseconds after AF nest ablation. Based on the possibility of getting vagal denervation by AF nest ablation, we proposed the cardioneuroablation, that is a procedure with aim to get significant long-lasting vagal response attenuation. Here, scheme of the cardiac autonomic nervous system. There are three main branches, the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, and the sensory, and only the parasympathetic is prone to be eliminated by cardioneuroblation because only the parasympathetic one presents the postganglionic neuron in the atrial wall. The neurons of the sympathetic and sensory system are located far from the heart, so they recovered after the ablation. Uh, it is important to remember the position of the ganglionated plexi that present a high number of postganglionic neurons, mainly the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. They are located uh, between the superior vena cava and aorta, the first ganglionated plexi, the second one in, at the insertion of the right pulmonary veins, the third one at the insertion of the inferior vena cava and coronary sinus ostium, and the fourth one at the insertion of the left pulmonary veins. The endocardial radio frequency has enough energy to ablate the GPs. It typically reaches up to 15 millimeters in depth, and according to the literature, it can even cause thermic lesions on the esophageal wall. How to confirm the vagal denervation? For the denervation control, we initially used the sinus rate and the increase in the Wenckenbach's point, in addition to the reduction of the sinus node recovery time. However, these parameters did not seem completely reliable. Furthermore, the atropine test at the end of the procedure should be negative after the denervation. However, the reliability of the atropine test is hindered by the denervation itself. Recently, we Charlie et al. published a remarkable study demonstrating that the control of the cardioneuroblation only by changes in sinus rate is not safe and is not enough. In order to drive the cardioneuroblation with a hard endpoint, in 2015, we published the extracardiac vagal stimulation, which is a simple method to control and check the progress of the cardioneuroblation. The extracardiac vagal stimulation may be easily performed by an electrophysiology catheter positioned close to the jugular foramen, through the superior vena cava and the internal jugular vein. At this point, the proximity of the vagus nerve allows its stimulation by an electrical field, even without direct contact. This allows evaluation of the denervation being an immediate, measurable, and reproducible endpoint. On the bottom, it is clear that the atropine completely abolished the vagal stimulation response. Cardioneuroablation mapping. At the beginning of the cardioneuroblation, it is performed an extracardiac vagal stimulation to see the vagal response, in this case, a very long asystole, to use it to compare with the progression of the denervation along the procedure. The number of points to be ablated in a cardioneuroblation depends on the response to the extracardiac vagal stimulation. In this map, we represent the most relevant. Depending on the vagal response, it may be necessary to eliminate more atrial fibrillation nest in the insertion of the pulmonary veins in the additional ganglionated plexi areas in the Waterstone groove and in the crista terminalis. 
From the first publication, we have been reporting that the most important ablation spot to treat sinus bradycardia is the P point that is located in the left and right interatrial septum from the right pulmonary veins insertion to the fossa ovalis. Ablation of this area used to cause the most increase in the sinus rate, but it is not enough for AV block treatment. In 2011, we developed the fractionation software that marks the AF nest on the electroanatomical map in the velocity system. After the anatomical ablation, if there is still a vagal response, we use the fractionation to locate and ablate additional AF nests outside the GPs until the vagal response is completely eliminated. The cardinal ablation is finished when there is no more vagal response. In this case, the vagal stimulations show no more bradycardia, no more asystole, no AV block. At the end of the cardinal ablation, it's important to repeat the extracardiac vagal stimulation with atrial pacing in order to see if there is AV block. In case there is AV block, it's necessary to resume the ablations until to eliminate completely the AV block induced by extracardiac vagal stimulation. Cardioner ablation results in neurocardiogenic syncope. And here we can see the results of the cardioner ablation in neurocardiogenic syncope. The cardinal ablation presents better results than the clinical treatment and the pacemaker implantation. However, the best result observed with cardioner ablation controlled by extracardiac vagal stimulation with complete elimination of the vagal response. Does the cardioner ablation cause long-term denervation? Obviously, it is essential to check if the cardioner ablation causes long-term denervation. In this study, it was demonstrated by using the RR variability that enough denervation persists for more than two years, which is the usual time for natural re -innervation. Can the cardioner ablation be performed only from the right? There are several authors that uh, are trying to perform the cardioner ablation only in the right atrium. However, it is important to see the results of the extracardiovagal stimulation in this field. Here we have a patient submitted to cardioner ablation only in the right atrium. Uh, he had uh, a syncope neurocardiogenic, and here it's possible to observe that after the cardioner ablation in the right atrium, there is an important cardio inhibition caused by extracardiac vagal stimulation. So it is clear that after the cardioner ablation in the right atrium, the vagal effect was not eliminated. And here we can see the same patient submitted to cardioner ablation in both atrium, right and left. And uh, we are doing the extracardiac vagal stimulation, showing that uh, the vagal effect was completely eliminated. So this kind of study show that for uh, a complete vagal effect elimination, a complete vagal denervation, it is necessary to get the cardioneuroblation in both atria. Does the cardioneuroblation cause arrhythmias? In this study of patients presenting sinus bradyarrhythmia, bradytachy arrhythmia, vagal atrial fibrillation that were submitted into cardioneuroblation and studied by two years, the cardioneuroblation decreased significantly the ventricular premature beats, decreased very significantly the ventricular coupled premature beats, decreased the, the ventricular tachycardias, reduced the very significantly the atrial premature beats, reduced significantly the atrial coupled premature beats, reduced also importantly the supraventricular tachycardia and caused practically elimination of the pulses and reduced the most the duration of the pulses. So the cardioneuroblation in this study was clearly related to a reduction of ventricular arrhythmias 
and a reduction of supraventricular tachycardias and the supraventricular bradyarrhythmias. Thus, the cardioneuroablation increases the cardiovascular risk because of the reduction of the heart rate variability. Uh, it is an important question. After the cardioneuroablation, the heart rate variability is reduced primarily because of the reduction of the innervation, because of the denervation. This reduction is primary to elimination of the innervation without the relation of the cardiopathy. However, different from this is the periodic pause myocardial infarction. In this case, there is reduction of the heart rate variability secondary to a cardiopathy. Myocardial infarction, there is reduction of heart rate variability, reduction of the parasympathetic tone, and increase of the sympathetic tone. And after cardioneuroablation, there is reduction of parasympathetic tone and reduction of the sympathetic tone. I think this situation is totally different and presents a profile of low risk. Cardioneuroablation conclusions. Nowadays, the cardioneuroablation has a very good indication based on clinical atropine test, holter, and head up tilt test. It has a very good approach based on the modern technology of AF ablation. It has a very good prevision of the result based on the atropine test. If the patient has a positive atropine test, probably he will have a very good result of the procedure. The cardioneurobation has also a very good procedure control and hard endpoint, based on extracardiac vagal stimulation, AP parameters, and even based on the perablation atropine test. And it has an easy follow-up based on clinical heart rate variability, holter, and head up tilt test. In conclusion, cardioneuroablation achieved an excellent degree of acute vagal denervation that persists for long term, preventing cardiolibitory syncope in 90% of patients up to 40 months of follow-up. Cardioneuroablation controlled by extracardiac vagal stimulation has been showing better long-term result than the one controlled only by atropine and or AP parameters, preventing pacemaker implantation in most of the cardioinhibitory syncope patients. There is nothing to be disclosed by all the authors. The extracardiac vagal stimulation was proposed in 2015 in this publication in JAK. It is a vagal stimulation tool with several applications in electrophysiology. It was first proposed to control vagal denervation during cardioneuroblation. Why we need the extracardiac vagal stimulation? The atropine test was used at the beginning to evaluate the denervation. Would the atropine challenge be good enough to test the vagal denervation at the end of the cardioneuroblation? Uh, the answer is surely not. The atropine test has less reliability as the higher is the heart rate. So it is not a good test to evaluate the denervation at the end of the cardioneuroblation. Because of this, several authors have been using the increase of the sinus rate during the cardioneuroblation. However, we, Charlie and Coles, have been showing that sinus risk mass relation is not reliable in the point for cardioneuroblation. It's necessary to use the uh, vagal stimulation to see the elimination of the vagal response. The procedure consists of placing an EP catheter close to the jugular foramen through the internal jugular vein. In this region, the vagus is very close and it may be stimulated without contact. Customized stimulators, gas stimulator or electromyograph can be used. Stimulation causes immediate asystole and or AV block that are completely abolished in case of atropine infusion. Here we have a short movie showing the advancing of the catheter inside of internal jugular up to the jugular foramen to make the extracardiac vagal stimulation. It is the best point to get the vagal stimulation. At the beginning of the cardioneuroblation, it's necessary to do uh, extracardiac vagal stimulation that typically shows a very long assistive or even high degree AV block like in this example. 
after the cardiac neuroblation, it's important to check the position of the catheter and repeat exactly the same extracardiac vagal stimulation, showing, like in this case, that there was complete elimination of the vagal effect. There is no more bradycardia, no more AV block, no more asystole. It shows that the denervation was achieved. While the vagus connects one preganglionic with one postganglionic fiber, the sympathetic preganglionic neuron connects with high number of postganglionic fibers. This explains the selective response of the vagus, which may act only on the AV node without sinus node depression. On the other hand, the sympathetic response is massive, acting on several organs at the same time. This tracing shows the selectivity of the vagus. This patient had a syncope by high degree AV block after meals without any change of sinus nodes rate. It was induced by a visceral, visceral reflex of the left vagus. 19 months after cardioneuroblation, she is asymptomatic with normal holter. What is the effect of the frequency on the extracardiac vagal stimulation? There is a natural selectivity so that the right vagus tends to suppress the sinus node and the left vagus tends to suppress more the AV node. However, this selectivity is lost when the vagal stimulation is maximum. This can be reproduced with vagal stimulation at different frequencies. For this purpose, let's have some stimulation of the left vagus at different frequencies. Here, there is an example of the stimulation of the left vagus with low frequency of stimulation, 8 Hz. It's possible to observe that there is induction of the AV block with low depression of the sinus node. Practically, there is no bradycardia of the sinus node, only induction of AV block caused by stimulation of the left vagus with low frequency of stimulation. Now let's have some stimulation of the left vagus with a frequency a little bit higher. With 10 hertz of stimulation, we can observe that there is induction of long AV block, several P waves blocked, uh, without a reduction significant of the sinus rate. This is very important because clinically, many patients present AV block without depression of the sinus node. With this kind of stimulation, we may reproduce this situation and it is very important to have the reproduction of this phenomenon during cardio ablation in order to see if the AV block is being corrected. Now, if we stimulate the left vagus with frequency higher, with 15 hertz to 70 hertz, there is induced a very important depression of the sinus node with a very long asystole. So this, the selectivity of the vagus is lost and the sinus node and AV node are depressed. When to finish the cardioneuroablation? Here we have an example of a very symptomatic patient that was submitted to a cardioneuroablation. However, she had symptoms after the cardioneuroablation. He continued to have symptoms and it was submitted to a new procedure. And here we can see the progression of the procedure. With the ablation of GP1, GP2, and GP3, after this ablation, the extracardiac uh, vagal stimulation was repeated and we can see a systole. We added the ablation of the GP4. However, there is also a systole after the extracardiac vagal stimulation. So we added the ablation of the coronary sinus roof, a waterstone groove, crystal terminalis, and the AF nest that, that were uh, located by fractionation mapping during the procedure. And after this, again, the extracardiac vagal stimulation showed a long asystole. So we redo the fractionation mapping and found a significant, a significant AF nest inside of superior 
right superior pulmonary vein. We can see here a little bit in the uh, border of the P point. And in this point, we ablated. We can see here the AF nest that may be observed in a frequency of 300 to 500 hertz. After the ablation, the AF nest disappeared. So after having remake the fractionation mapping and eliminate the last atrial fibrillation nest inside of the right superior pulmonary vein, the extracardiac vagal stimulation showed that the vagal response was completely eliminated. So this example showed it to us that it is important to control the response of the extracardiac vagal stimulation. And I have to resume the ablation until complete elimination of the vagal response. The vagal stimulation is also very useful to study supraventricular tachycardias because during ventricular pacing, the extracardiac vagal stimulation blocks the conduction by normal pathways and preserves the conduction in abnormal pathway. Technical considerations about extracardiac vagal stimulation. General anesthesia or deep sedation is necessary because the vagus has a high number of sensory fibers. The use of atropine or similar is totally contraindicated. Check if the catheter is medially directed just above the wisdom teeth. Confirm the catheter position by anterior posterior and lateral view on X-ray. Both vagus can be tried. A stimulation with 15 hertz, 15 microseconds and 1 volt per kilogram up to 70 volts. Avoid bursts more than 5 seconds. The cardio inhibition effect is typically transient and very short. Stimulation can be repeated whenever necessary. Add atrial or ventricular pacing to study AV and VA conduction. And finally, in more than 3,000 extracardiac vagal stimulation, we did not see any complication. Practical applications of the extracardiac vagal stimulation. The first one is control of the denervation degree in cardio neuroablation procedures. Induction of vagal atrial fibrillation and definition of the endpoint. Study of the functional reserve of the sinus and AV node. Differential diagnosis of the supraventricular tachycardias. Immediate reversion of the AV node dependent tachycardias. Study of the electrical stability of the atrial. Unveiling concealed anomalous pathways. Unveiling inapparent wolf parkinson white syndrome and final in the point in ablation of the Kent's bundle. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Yao from Beijing, China. I'm honored to be invited to participate this year at Prague meeting. So I'm invited to give this uh, presentation and cardio neutron ablation as therapy to neurally mediated bradycardia. As we all know, the reverse modeling of sinus node functions after cathode ablation was noticed uh, many years ago, just uh, since the very beginning of the atrial fibrillation ablation, even with this uh, segment of PV isolations. And it varies with, uh, uh, you know, ablationists, with their strategy, with their, you know, patient selects or whatever. But, uh, and it is such a phenomenon may last for one year, even longer. However, during the recent years, more and more people, when they try to use a cry balloon ablation, they have noticed such a phenomenon more often than they apply the retrocurrency ablation. And we all know it's just related to the ganglia plexus, which is located at the left atrium. And this slides give you a basic idea of the location of this uh, ganglia plexus and how it looks like an uh, animal uh, left atrium. And uh, this is also another example to show us the anatomic location of ganglia plexus in the left atrium and the right atrium. 
And this information might be very useful if one do not have uh, a stimulator for targeting. And about the cardio neural ablation, which was newly in the created concept, uh, it means the ganglia plexus could be abolished by cast ablations. It may rebalance the physiology function uh, due, due to the you know, uh, special feature of a ganglia plexus. And also due to the uh, anatomic location can be easily targeted and uh, you know, abolished by the cast ablations. The potential indication for cardiolution ablation, including visual vehicle syncope, which is known as VVS, bradyarrhythmia, arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, and uh, of course, some special subtype of long QT syndrome, such as long QT syndrome 3. Uh, the methods for ganglia plexus targeting, including anatomic electrogram mapping, and also high frequency stimulations. For anatomic targets, and this, I hope this image may give us a basic idea of the most frequent location of this uh, GPS, including left superior, which is exactly you know, at the roof next to the orifice of the uh, antrum of the LSCP, uh, sorry, LSPV, uh, and then right anterior ganglia plexus somewhere you know, between the RSPV and LIPV and the antrums, RIGP, LRGP, and the CS middle or even proximal GP. In some cases, which is not rare, you will also find the GP located in the region between the left appendage and the pulmonary veins in this region. So the methods currently for targeting of this ganglia plexus uh, are virus. As we all know, Dr. Pachon from Brazil firstly reported uh, this, uh, you know, ablation, and he uh, his method, including ablation on both right atrium and left atriums, with the mapping of frequency dormant, and. Uh, Dr. Rivarola, uh, they also performed the similar ablations uh, on both atrial and, and le right and left atrium. Uh, Dr. Axel from Turkey, he reported his uh, methods, majority ablation on the right side, but may also uh, apply on the left side for the right anterior uh, GP. And Dr. De Bruyne in Belgium also reported they are, you know, um, so quite similar, like Dr. Axu. And we uh, perform this way in two ways. Um, as we all know, for years, we didn't have a uh, stimulator for ganglia plexus, uh, uh, plexus. So we mainly rely on the anatomy targeting. And then now we have a, a micropace three, we try to apply the high frequency stimulation more often, although it, it is not always reliable. And this is the most frequent uh, site we, we ablated when we use anatomy. And even when you try to use a high frequency stimulation, we still try to do uh, according to this, uh, you know, anatomy guidance. And the high frequency stimulation, the protocol we're currently using was uh, invented by Zhang Nipu's group, which reported about more than, you know, 12 years ago. And uh, the frequency varied from 20 to 50 Hertz. We normally use uh, 30 Hertz. The output varies from 10 to 150 volts, and we use uh, 20 at the million. And the pulse values, we normally use a 10. And the duration should be less than five seconds to uh, avoid the sympathetic activation. And the positive was uh, stimulation was defined as sinus rhythm decreased more than 50%, or with a sinus pulse or any block, more than two seconds. 
also would like to recommend people try to notice this uh, parameter on the uh, halter monitoring. The deceleration capacity, which is known as DC, can be uh, very useful, but very easily uh, conducted and cheap parameters for the evaluation of the vehicle tones. And it can be a quantitative assessment of cardiac vehicle tones was firstly reported by Dr. Bohr uh, on the ischemic, you know, VT uh, prediction. And uh, we just found uh, with a more than 7.5 DC value, it can be used to diagnose with, with vehicle syncope and our increased vehicle tones. And the patient come us to us with our suspected uh, visual vehicle syncope. Once, even, even the uh, head up test is negative, which we know is, is often to be seen. And combined with the uh, encouraged DC, we can still make our diagnosis with the uh, visual vehicle syncope. So we believe this can be also applied with this uh, uh, sinus bradycardia or every block is functional or we say with a uh, hyper vehicle tones. Yeah. So the non-term uh, effectiveness of uh, cardio during ablation uh, with uh, uh, high-frequency stimulation or anatomic targeting was shown uh, on this uh, study which we reported uh, five years ago. You can see anatomical uh, targeting slightly, you know, uh, worse than the high frequency guided, but uh, there is the differences is not significant. So it's you can it's almost uh, uh, you know same same. And we have must say the role of the right anterior ganglia plexus is very important for such a uh, ablation if we want to increase uh, sinus rhythms. And uh, we performed a study, you can see with 500, 115 consecutive uh, VVS patients. And uh, before we ablate the right anterior ganglia plexus, no matter where we ablate, RSGP, LI, RIGPs, Compare with the baselines, there are almost no changes. But once we apply the ablations here on right anterior complexes, you can see the heart rate you know, suddenly increased from 60 to 80s BPM. And the long-term effectiveness on heart rate can be, you know, a very long, even after two years, you can still see this increasement. Uh, in China, there's another group of doctors, they um, conducted this, this ablation for their sick sinus, uh, you know, uh, bradycardia. And uh, although there are some slight differences with the location or deflation of the ganglia process uh, here, they call it here as RAGP, which is about a little bit inferior uh, than we believe. And they, they just, instead, they just, uh, uh, you know, define our uh, LTX SVC ganglia plexus, which is slightly superior to this RAGP position. So they found a position here is the most effective, which might be uh, you know, classified as part of the RGP in most centers I know. So, however, these results also indicate this region might be very important for the, uh, the sinus bradycardia if you want to increase that by ablation. So, right anterior ganglia plexus also might be used as a first target which may suppress a vagal reflex during the atrial fibrillations. This is confirmed by one of our, uh, you know, uh, trials. And we found this right anterior ganglia plexus area was a crucial region to prevent vagal reflex 
doing the HFAB, PV isolation, or linear ablation, whatever. Uh, Dr. De Bruyne also re reported uh, unifocal right-sided uh, right RAGP ablation from the right atrium and uh, just the next door, let's say, may effectively increase the heart rate and may last long. Uh, how do we sub select the patients for such a therapy? I must say, by now, the data is limited. And, uh, but based on the basic knowledge we know, and also especially the cases we accumulated with uh, HF ablation, we believe it's very important. Firstly, we have to discriminate the intrinsic 6 syndrome or AV block from those with high vagal tones. So the assessment of the contribution of the parasympathetic uh, system would be very important. And we can do this by two ways. For one way is atropine test. We give pe people atropine IV for 15 minutes and uh, an increasement of over 25% uh, or sinus rate reach to faster, more than 90, you know, beat BPM in the first 15 minutes should be considered as a positive response. And anyone reached that positive response supposed to be benefit with this uh, vigor, uh, I would say, uh, ganglia plexus ablations. And as I said before, the deceleration capacity, which is known as DC, more than 7.5, also indicates a high vagal tones. So for patients with AV block, we believe the EP study, EP study should be performed. Also, the adenosine atropine might be helpful to exclude the intrinsic or extrinsic AV block. And uh, on the other hand, we must think about the contraindication for such a therapy. Uh, in our center, we, by now, we just uh, forbid any patients who come with either verification syncope or 6 syndrome with underlying structural heart disease, especially ischemic heart disease and heart failure. And uh, we also do not perform such a therapy with a patient with severe hypertension, diabetes, and other any other diseases which require beta blockers. So by now, we do have seen hundreds of patients with uh, improved uh, bradycardia, but uh, all of those mostly come with uh, HFA violation. We only calculated 38 patients come to for ablation for sinus, uh, you know, bradycardia or intermediate AV block alone. And the atropine test and the DC were performed in all of these patients. This is the baseline characteristics of these 38 patients. They always are, you know, a right, uh, 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 you know, normal uh, ejection fraction. And the clinical outcome is, is good, it's quite good. 30 per, uh, patients had rec no recurrence of any types of uh, bradycardia arrhythmia, either sinus bradycardia or AV block. But uh, eight of them had uh, still got some, you know, and this is the uh, details. And this is a hard term monitoring during the flow up. And you can see this, uh, these uh, effects may last long, uh, within two years. And uh, this, is, this is like one case, a 33 years female with the current syncope due to the intermittent sinus arrest at a frequent junction escape region. And DC uh, were 30 with a positive atropine, you know, test. And you can see it's junctional rhythms combined with atrial rhythm. And uh, this is a baseline EP study. And ablation at the RGP uh, immediately just to 
cure of the junk tourism and um, restore the sun systems. And uh, this is ablation from both left side and right side. And you can see the sun system increased significantly, but it's normal. So this is a uh, uh, EP parameters before and after ablation. We can see the uh, significant improvement simply due to the uh, uh, RGP ablations. So in summary, cardiolurion ablation may effectively modify the bradycardia arrhythmia caused by hypervagal tone, which should be confirmed by atropine or DC tests. RGP is the only target GP to increase the heart rate and may achieved uh, from both right side and left side approaches. The indication, however, missiles and endpoints need to be established by a further study. And uh, that's my presentation. And uh, before I uh, introduce the case, I would like to uh, briefly introduce that case. Patient was a strong man, about 155 centimeter and uh, nearly 100 kilometer uh, from Inner Mongolia, who only got uh, syncope once he ate spicy food. But he had experienced such a syncope for a dozen times. Uh, and uh, the atropine uh, test, we repeat twice. Uh, and also we will give repeat dose 15 minutes later. The maximum heart uh, beat should uh, can only reach to 80. And the baseline with the baseline uh, heart rate normally about 45 something. So even double dose of atropine could, could only increase uh, the heart rate to uh, 80s, which indicate patient may have some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pathologic, you know, uh, situation with the sinus atrium. However, the results, in, even in that case, the results is good because atropine test, uh, although it's not positive, but it's still, you know, I would, I must say it's positive, not that ideal, but it's still positive. And the DC is also very high. So the results is quite good. And uh, you can see it's mainly due to ablation at the right atrial, uh, uh, right anterior ganglia plexus. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Yao from Beijing Wuhan Hospital. Uh, first of all, thank Joseph for inviting me to present this case. Today, we are going to present a case uh, who is a 48 years old male, come from Inner Mongolia, with a history of syncope for seven years. For this patient, the declaration capacity, which is known as DC, is 26.6, which is very high. And uh, we plan this ablation not only to cure, hopefully it will work, cure his syncope, but uh, also try to increase his sinus bradycardia. So this patient is basically come from both purposes. So now I'm going to show you where are these jungle plexus mostly located. First of all, let's see this PAU. So I would like to say it's supposed to be here in this region. Yeah, it's probably uh, uh, exactly at the center of the, one of the most important ganglia plexus, which we call RAGP, right anterior ganglia plexus. So it is supposed to be the region. Let's put a mark here. Okay, so, so supposed to around this area, uh, anatomy. So then let's try to go to tablet, the LST, left superior ganglia plexus. Uh, what's what's her? Okay, what's that trying? Okay, now you can see. Yeah, about this region. Let's put a mark. Okay, let's suppose we read this region. In some case, you may also find this ganglia plexus on this ridge zone between the 
appendix and the left uh, pulmonary vein. But uh, normally we do not do here. So, and the, now let's shift to the posterior wall. Oh, okay. Typically, it's supposed to be here. R I I G P. Supposed to be this region. Let's put them out. Of course, we cannot be sure that it's be so uh, you know precise. But uh, it's supposed to be around the re region, and we are going to ablate in a really, really large room here. And then R I P E here. And normally along this CS catheter here, yeah, the CS catheter middle and the uh, presbyteral. Yeah, let's move to here. Same. Okay, this is the where we are going to ablate if you do not have a uh, stimulator. But since we do have one, so I'm going to try to show you how we confirm whether we can see this uh, vagal to the flex during the stimulation. Now uh, we are going to do the high frequency stimulation. But normally we start from LSPV, which should be the most frequent, you know. Recording. Ah, now, let's see. We normally place this at the. Okay. Uh, no, we cannot see. We define the positive as the uh, heart rate prolonged 50% or the long pause longer than two seconds. Now, as you see, Nobody can use something, you know, like uh, atrial fibrillation. Okay, I think it's still negative. See, we basically make this case to be a complete anatomic uh, targeting the live case. So although we want to see this, uh, it's okay. You may see this legal reflex during the ablation. Let me start. Now the baseline heart rate is, okay, see, see, mm. long pulse, right? Definitely, you see, reach to the, okay, you see, this is a significant legal reflex. The heartbeat prolonged at least 50%. See? So high frequency <laughs> uh, stimulation, now it seems like the vagal reflex is gone. Let me extend it a little bit slightly in this anterior. This, yeah, here. You can see this large potential here. Okay. Mm, you see? Yeah, again, the heart rate drop. See, long holes. So this is a large known of the gun plexus. Let me expand it one more time to more anterior way. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is large zone. Right? That's the junction. Uh, we have to back up pacing and the rapid vision code. You see, on the CS catheter, there is no atrial activation. Okay, we, we saw one. We just saw one. Yeah, you see? However, the baseline, the heartbeat is almost the same as the baseline of, you know, standard Let's go try to the LIPSGP. Okay. Yeah, see if we can see. For this posterior, especially this LI and RIGP, we normally only try less than 30 seconds. Uh, as is the concern we all know. We don't want to jeopardize the uh, esophageal. Okay. If, if there is no response, we will just stop within 15 seconds. There was a slight one once I started. 
Now it's gone. Right? Okay. Let me try to move away. Yeah, here. A little bit is a little inferior. See if we can see that. Yeah, see here. Oh. Yeah, there is no significant this box. So I just uh, stop here. Normally, if you start the ablation here, in few seconds, you can see significant increase after seven seconds. We will see why it happened. Okay, let's start. Heart rate about 43 right now. Oh, two seconds. Okay, there is actually a slowing down of a reflex. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's increased to about 50. You see, the heartbeat increased to 50. Yeah. About 50. Yeah, that's a shit out of Okay. Okay, see, now the heart rate is uh, 67. Exactly, right now. So, baseline was 43 something. So, we increased his heartbeat about 50%. It's especially a simple, uh, after the RAGP ablation, which I have noticed that before. And uh, some doctor would like to go to ablate the, the left door on the right side. Then, 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 okay, let's, let me show you how it looks like. Right? Half minutes uh, will be fine. Okay, 30 seconds, I'll stop here. And also local potential is gone. Uh, now the heart rate about 66. People may uh, doubt whether this uh, increasement was due to the pain. Uh, actually, I don't think so because this pain exists when we have a bit other kind of places, right? But it only you know, occurred, the heartbeat increase only occurred after we have a lot anterior. Process. So we have seen that many times. So definitely we are going to follow and recall the you know cultures monitoring and the updates that that uh, you know later we are at the end of this uh, video. So that's all for, for this case. Uh, thank you. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the Professor Joseph Kastner for his kind invitation to this excellent meeting, and it's a great honor for me to be here at this virtually. And today I will try to explain the potential usage of cardinal ablation strategy in patients with atrioventricular ventricular block, and this is my disclosures. As you know that cardinal ablation is catheter-based autonomic modulation of intrinsic cardiac nerve system. And intrinsic cardiac nerve system contains both apparent parasympathetic and sympathetic motor neurons, apparent sensory neurons, and local circuit neurons. All the most autonomic ganglia or epicardial ganglia are embedded within the epicardium. There is a highly dense network of efferent nerve fibers at the myocardial and in even endocardial levels. This is very important. So during cardioneural ablation, we can ablate this, both this epicardial ganglia and neuronal fibers from this epicardial ganglia to atrium and ventricle. If you look at the macro photograph of the posterior inferior surface of left atrium with right inferior pulmonary vein, you can see the localization of or distribution of this epicardial ganglia and postganglionative neuronal fibers around uh, epicardial level and actually the concept of ganglionated plexus defines grouping epicardial ganglia in different atrial sites and within a ganglionated plexus site we see both parasympathetic and sympathetic neuronal fibers so <coughs> contrary to the previous belief actually during cardioneurulation you can ablate both 
parasympathetic and sympathetic system. According to animal experiments, we know that the great majority of ganglionated plexus are located in three different epicardial fat pads. The first one is aorta superior vena cava, fat pad between aorta and superior vena cava, and this is a head station for vagal innervation of full atria and ventricular levels. The other one is right pulmonary vena and right atrial fat pad, and if you look at the localization of this fat pad, it's very close to sinoatrial node area. And the other one is inferior vena cava, left atrial fat pad, located between lower part of left atrium and inferior vena cava. And this site is very close to localization of atrioventricular conduction system. But in human, actually, we see a very, very complicated uh, distribution for a uh, ganglionated plexus site. And in human, there are at least five major and two minor ganglionated plexus uh, around left and right atrium. The first one is superior right atrial GP between superior vena cava and aorta. Actually, this GP uh, called as aorta superior vena cava fat pad in human spaceman. And the other one is posterior right atrial GP located between right pulmonary vents and right atrium. And some groups uh, divided this GP as right superior GP and right inferior GP in electrophysiological study. The other one is posterior medial left atrial GP located between lower part of left atrium and inferior vena cava. And in animal data, this GP is called as inferior vena cava left atrial fat pad. The other one is superior left atrial GP. And the last one is posterior lateral or left inferior GP. But please remember that intrinsic cardiac autonomic nerve system consists of both this epicardial ganglia and neuronal extensions of this ganglia on the human atria and ventricles, and which is called as ganglionated suplexus. Actually, in this well-designed animal experiments, Billman and Randall et al. Uh, studied the right atrial and right ventricular electrograms during baseline, during vagal stimulation, and vagal stimulation plus atrial pacing. And actually, vagal stimulation via cervical nervous vagus cause negative dronotropic and negative chromotropic effects. So during vagal stimulation, you will see significant sinus bradycardia or sinus asystole episode, during atrial pacing, if you look at the right ventricular electrograms, you see still bradycardia due to AV block. But then they removed inferior vena cava left atrial fat pad area surgically and applied vagal stimulation again. There was still sinus bradycardia on right atrial and right ventricular electrograms, but during atrial pacing, there was no uh, right ventricular bradycardia because they completely eliminated AV block with this way. So they said that this epicardial fat pad is important for vagal innervation of atrioventricular node. And then they removed right pulmonary vena and right atrial fat pad area, and there was no bradic sinus bradycardia, and there was no AV block. So this epicardial fat pad was important for vagal innervation of sinus node area in animal experiments, but in human, Again, there is a very, very complicated interconnection between different ganglionated plexus sites, and it's not possible to conduct such an experimental study in humans. So uh, we need some uh, well-designed study by using cardioneurobulation strategy to demonstrate uh, a similar uh, existence of a similar uh, selective innervation for senoatrial node or atrioventricular connection system. According to ESC guidelines, Patients considered for antibiotic pacemaker therapy divided as persistent and intermittent bradycardia. And according to ESC, they said that in all persistent bradycardia cases, the main cause of disease are structural involvement of sinoatrial node or atrioventricular conduction system. But in intermittent bradycardia cases, uh, actually in minority of cases, the main cause of uh, bradycardia episodes 
might be vagal overactivity and which is called as functional sinus bradycardia or functional AV block. So if you see a paroxysmal AV block episode, you should differentiate functional or intrinsic AV block. To do that, you should check Holter characteristics and you should check PP and PR interval change during AV block episode or before AV block episodes. For example, in this trace, during one to one AV conduction, PP interval is 800 millisecond. But during AV block episode, as you see in here, PP interval prolonged to 1000. And uh, 60 milliseconds. So you see a clear sinus rate slowing during AV block episodes. The main cause of this phenomenon, vagal overactivity, affect both sinoatrial node and atrioventricular connection system in a similar way. So you, sh you should see a sinus bradycardia during AV block episodes. And just before AV block episodes, we see a PR prolongation. For example, do, during one to one AV conduction, PR interval is 130 millisecond. But during uh, just before AV block episode, we see a clear PR prolongation, like 200 millisecond or 260 millisecond. Contrary, PR remains unchanged and sinus rate increases or doesn't change in intrinsic or structural AV block cases. Again, according to ESC guideline, in all persistent AV block cases, the main cause intrinsic involvement of atrioventricular conduction system. But if you look at this ECG rest, this rest ECG, you can see complete AV block. But after atropine administration, we achieve one-to-one -one AV conduction. So in this particular case, despite existence of persistent AV block, the main cause of atrioventricular conduction problem was still vagal over activity. So by uh, using atropine challenge, you can uh, basically differentiate functional and intrinsic AV block episodes. Actually, so far, there has no data uh, studying the effect of cardioneurobulation in patients with pure AV block. But recently, we, pu uh, we published our single center experience in Latin American Heart Rhythm Society. Actually, in this study, we used fragmented electrograms to select our uh, targets during cardioneurobulation strategy. We defined uh, seven distinct GP sites, right superior GP between anterior wall of right superior pulmonary vein and superior vena cava, uh, right inferior GP in interatrial septum area, posterior medial left GP between a corner sinus ostium and lower part of left atrium. Left inferior GP is located in posterior wall of left inferior pulmonary vein. And aorta superior vena cava GP is located just at the part of a right superior GP site. And to differentiate functional AV block cases, we use the stepwise approach. Uh, if we see any reversible causes, these cases were excluded. And then in patients with persistent AV block, we check the atropine response. And if we see a one-to-one -one AV conduction after atropine administration, we performed exercise stress test. And uh, you have to demonstrate a perfect AV conduction during exercise, and if you see a uh, worsening on uh, AV conduction during exercise, uh, this uh, case might be caused by uh, intra his uh, level uh, problem. So you should exclude these cases as well. And at the end, you should check the electrophysiological study to demonstrate suprahistian level of. AV block. In paroxysmal AV block cases, we checked Holter characteristics for PP and PR prolongation or a relationship, and then we applied atropine and checked the atropine response. In all cases, we uh, performed exercise stresses in all cases, and then we checked uh, electrophysiological study uh, characteristics, and we excluded existence of intra or infrahistian AV block in all cases. And as I 
surprising finding, we had three isolated congenital complete AV block cases. In this case, inclusion criteria are average heart rate less than 50 BPM or abrupt symptomatic pause in ventricular rate, which were two or more times the baseline cycle length on halter recordings. And as you see that in this case, uh, mean follow-up time was longer than four years. And as you see in here, we achieved a clear a significant increase on minimum and mean heart rate in halter recordings during follow-up, and we didn't see any new um, bradycardia episode on follow-up halter recordings in this case. Let's check the uh, first case. As I uh, mentioned in my previous slide, we achieved one to one AV conduction after atrophic administration. In this case, we created anatomical shell of right atrial and left atrial structures. For right atrial mapping, we usually use a decapolar coronary sinus catheter. For left atrial uh, mapping, we usually use a circular mapping catheter. And actually, the most important steps, you should uh, clearly demonstrate a close relationship between right atrial and left atrial structures in this uh, mapping step because the great majority of epicardial ganglia are located in this midline area between right atrial and left atrial structures. You can check the sinus activation uh, mapping to uh, demonstrate localization of sinoatrial node area. And we usually, uh, we usually map the phrenic nerve by using uh, high amplitude pacing, but in great majority of cases, uh, phrenic nerve will be far from your ablation target. And then we changed uh, mapping catheter with the classical open irrigated tip uh, RF ablation catheter, and we changed our bandpass filter settings from classical 130 to 500 hertz to uh, 200 and 500 hertz. So we uh, use a higher high pass filter and we try to define these fragmented electrograms in possible GP sites. Regardless of high or low amplitude ones, we try to target all fragmented electrograms in uh, a probable, in seen in probable localization of ganglionated plexus sites. According to our current strategy, you can see the distribution of this uh, major epicardial ganglia around right and left atrium levels. And as an important point, according to animal spaceman, right superior GP located between anterior wall of right superior pulmonary vena, super, postreceptor wall of superior vena cava, which is important for vagal innervation of sinoatrial node, according to animal spaceman again, and the posterior medial left GP located between uh, left atrium and coronary sinus ostium, and this is important for the generation of atrial and nodal system. This uh, 3D mapping data has, uh, is get, was get, gotten by uh, the first case with a complete AV block on rest ECG. At the beginning of the procedure, we created the anatomical shell of right atrial and left atrial structures. You can see the intracardiac electrogram at the beginning of the procedure. That was complete AV block. So we targeted posterior medial left GP site because this GP is important for vagal innervation of AV node, according to animal experiments. During RF application on this GP site, we see a sinus bradycardia due to vagal effect of uh, vagal discharge effect of uh, ablation, but you can still see uh, existence of AV block. So we perform another RF application in a closed area by checking fragmented electrograms. You can see the fragment electrograms on tip of ablation catheter. And despite ablation on the right side, we couldn't achieve one-to-one -one AV conduction. 
So we went to the right superior GP side. Actually, this GP is important for sinus node area, but please look at here. We started the ablation. In the first step, you see a steep increase on sinus rate. This is a usual response because this GP is important for sinus node. But then we continued the ablation. And here we go. We achieved one-to-one -one AV conduction in this side. This is another case. In this case, you can see well, it's type 1 AV block. This case was also persistent AV block, and there was also right bundle branch block. But we demonstrated complete resolution of AV block after atropine administration. We ablated left superior GP, uh, Marshall tract GP, and right superior GP in this case. Then we went to the posterior media left GP site via left atrium. Please look at intracardiac electrograms. We are performing ablation now. You can see the fragment electrograms at the bottom. We are still seeing AV block. We couldn't want achieve one-to-one -one AV conduction. Please look at here. Sorry, I will demonstrate. In here, yes. We are seeing some 120 AV conduction episodes, but then there's still Mobit type 1 AV block. So we went to the right side. We are in around corner science ostium. This is the first RF attempt. And after the first RF attempt, we achieved one to one AV conduction in posterior medial left GP site in this case. In this patient, uh, there was correct transposition. So we didn't want to apply transeptal puncture due to high risk. So we just mapped uh, right atrium and right atrial structures. Uh, we performed ablation uh, fragment electrograms for right our aorta superior venicava GP site, right superior GP site, and now we are in a posterior medial left GP site. You can see the Mobitz type 1 AV block at the beginning of the ablation. And during ablation, we achieved one to one AV conduction with a significant shortening on PR interval at the end of the ablation. Yes, here we go. You can see shortening of PR interval. In this case, there was a history of atrial septal defect surgery. So we didn't uh, apply transeptal puncture. We mapped right atrial structures, performed ablation for right superior GP site, and then we went to the posterior medial left GP site. Please look at PR interval at the beginning of the ablation. Here we go. We see clear shortening on PR interval during RF application on this posterior medial left GP site. As a take on messages, sorry, um, according to our uh, cohort in paroxysmal AV block cases, the success rate was almost 100% by using cardioneuroablation strategy. But in persistent AV block cases, our success rate was uh, almost 80%. And mean follow up time was higher than 20 months. As a take on messages, in a high selective cohort of functional AV block, cardioneuroablation is associated with substantial and durable reduction in recurrence of AV block episodes during medium term follow up. Results might be better in paroxysmal AV block, both biatrial and right sided cardioneuroablation have excellent and comparable acute success rate, and posterior medial left GP might be a valuable target for elimination of atrioventricular nodal vagal innervation in cardioneuroablation strategy. Thanks for your attention. Hi, 
I'm Dan Wichterle from ICAM, Prague, Czech Republic. And the title of my presentation is Seeking Atrial Sweet Spots for Efficacious Denervation of Sinoatrial and Atrioventricle Nodes. My presentation is based on experience with more than 100 cardioneuroblation procedures at our institution since the year 2014. Our strategy is completely empirical, anatomically guided. For detection of ganglionic plexi sites, we do use neither endocardial high-frequency stimulation nor any sort of assessment of endocardial electrograms. However, we extensively use extracardiac vagal stimulation, uh, as I will mention later. As shown in this figure, we always pay attention to the position of the sinus node, here uh, annotated by activation mapping, and phrenic nerve, because uh, they are not always distant to required lesion sites. In recent two years, we included our patients into the series of small prospective investigations that compared in randomized fashion different lesion sets in order to establish the most efficacious strategy with minimum RF deliveries leading to fast and safe denervation of both nodes. It means a strategy with less extensive, not like here, by atrial ablation. Such investigations wouldn't be possible without extracardiac high-frequency, high-output vagal nerve stimulation via internal Juger vein that was developed by Jose Pachon, as you have heard today. And we had the opportunity to utilize his device and his method during our procedures in order to test repeatedly the responsiveness of sinus and AV nodes. It could be done theoretically after each ablation lesion and enabled us to follow the progression of denervation rather exactly. My task today is to present a brief overview of what we have found. Radiofrequency catheter ablation of the superior paraceptal ganglionic plexus significantly suppresses the vagal modulation of the sinus node. Sinus nodal denervation can be frequently, but not always, achieved by this cluster of lesions. By the way, this is our uh, published case of cardioneuroblation for swallowing syncope. And that was our strategy uh, a couple of years ago. Subsequently, we speculated that sort of horizontal lesion at the level of SVC right atrium junction instead of this cluster would be more efficacious because autonomic nerves enter the heart along grade vessels in cranial caudal direction and such a line would interrupt most of them. Specifically, we investigated this semicircular lesion in the posteroceptal quadrant of superior vena cava ostium composed of six equidistantly distributed ablation sites numbered in ascending order from number one to number six from posterolateral to pure septal positions. 16 patients were randomly assigned to the mutually opposite direction of ablation uh, from the site number one to the number to site number six and from number six uh, to site number one. The results are here. Response to vagal nerve stimulation is plotted as the longest pause uh, in seconds at baseline and after each RF energy delivery, we found that posterior lesions convey maximum, if not total, effect compared to septal lesions that had much less prominent effect. How to exactly find the sinus nodal denervation sweet spot? It is easy. The main landmark of, uh, of the white uh, SVC antrum is the ridge toward right atrial appendage that can be identified easily by mapping catheter uh, pullback from the SVC with anterior bend and looking for the site when it slips into the right atrial appendage. This is a landmark in vertical direction. This sweet spot is located at this level and at the same time it is very posterior, which means uh, at the SVC long axis 
in PA view. As concerns the investigated right atrium line, almost the same lesion uh, can be created from the aspect of the left atrium uh, in the anterior vestibulum of right superior pulmonary vein. This figure shows the lesion separately in the right atrium, in the left atrium, and in this biatrial configuration. You may appreciate that both lesions uh, can be created strictly contralaterally across the superior interatrial septum, which means that both are targeting the same space. It was not known whether the ablation lesion uh, uh, is more efficacious when performed from the aspect of right or left atrium. That is why we randomly assigned 24 patients to two ablation strategies, right atrium before left atrium ablation or left atrium before right atrium ablation, 12 and 12 patients. We investigated sinus node acceleration and again the response to vagal nerve stimulation. Top graphs uh, are uh, for patients with ablation starting at right atrium, bottom graphs are for those with ablation starting at left atrium. Left-sided graphs uh, show sinus rate and right-sided graphs show uh, inducible sinus rest. Data is always shown at baseline after the first ablation and after the second ablation in the opposite atrium. Irrespective of ablation order, the first ablation lesion on average uh, generated uh, two-thirds or maybe maximum three-quarters of the total effect. Left atrium ablation appeared uh, slightly more effective compared to right atrium ablation, uh, at least in terms of uh, response to vagal stimulation, but the between group difference was not significant. The right panel gives another look at the data using line plots focused on vaguely induced sinus pauses in individual patients. Again, you may appreciate that uh, right atrium ablation was slightly less effective, resulting in insufficient denervation in five patients, compared to two patients in whom the ablation started uh, at, uh, in the left atrium. However, the between group difference in this categorical evaluation was also statistically non-significant. In the end, uh, the sinus node was not fully denervated by the study lesions only in one patient in each study group. We conclude that both right and left atrium ablation clusters targeting the superior paraseptal ganglionic plexus convey complementary and in part independent effects. By atrial cardioneuroablation seems essential for efficacious sinus nodal denervation. On the other hand, in the future, we may end up with such minimized lesion configuration as in this figure. It works in many patients, but the study in this respect is not yet finished. The innervation of the AV node is considerably more difficult compared to the sinus node. So that the optimization of the effective lesion set is even more important than that for sinus nodal denervation. Our initial hypothesis, after numerous attempts and learning by Bernie together with the full use of extracardiac vagal stimulation, was that the sweet spot for AV nodal denervation sits at the bottom of the left atrium, slightly below the inferior border of uh, fossa ovalis and at the same time approximately in the middle uh, of the distance between the inferolateral mitral annulus and inferoposterior osteum of the right inferior pulmonary vein. Ice image uh, shows the typical site. Subsequently we investigated this area. Uh, we delivered five equidistantly distributed ablation lesions on the virtual line connecting the inferior osteum of right inferior pulmonary vein and inferior mitral annulus. Lesions were centered uh, symmetrically relative to the posterior uh, mid-left atrium line. 
as before an investigation was done in two directions septolateral and lateral septal and the uh, results are here response to vagal nerve stimulation is plotted as the longest pulse uh, due to AV block in seconds and it is done uh, at baseline and after each RF energy delivery we found that the site uh, which was the closest to, to the posterior mitral annulus resulted in the most prominent effect here on the other hand when the ablation direction was septolateral the progression of the innervation was much slower this is another look at the data using line plots for individual patients you may appreciate a nice effect in some patients after the ablation of site number five and nevertheless complete denervation of AV node due to the sterility lesion set was not reached in approximately half of the patients in most of them the final success was achieved by extension of ablation lesion toward uh, the inferior mitra annulus either endocardially or via the proximal coronary sinus therefore we started believing that this is a real critical area for AV nodal denervation However, the study is currently ongoing and I don't want uh, to present the preliminary results today. It suggests that epi-endoablation of this perimitral area alone is still not enough without prior, prior ablation of the previously described uh, sweet spot area. It is obvious that AV nodal ablation is challenging and that targeting of pyramidal space is the clue to the success. This space that is posterior to the crux of the heart is delimited by the middle bottom of the left atrium, by posterior aspect of uh, proximal coronary sinus and posterior inferior segment of the right atrium adjacent to ostium of the inferior vena cava. This area is difficult uh, in terms of imaging, navigation and catheter manipulation. Successful lesions here are also critically dependent on catheter tip orientation either against the myocardium or epicardial space. And I can't provide more specific information just now. This is currently under investigation. To make it uh, even more complex, Ablation of superior left ganglionic plexus is sometimes helpful as the last resort in the innervation of AV node. I hope uh, that this presentation was educational enough to help you to launch the cardioneuroablation program at your site. If you have already started doing such cases, it might help you to improve your efficacy and safety. Thank you for viewing. So, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for nice presentations uh, to all of you. Uh, it's a pity that we cannot meet here in Prague, but hopefully next uh, year or in the future we will. Uh, I have to apologize uh, Yao Yan, who uh, has a lot of cases tomorrow, and it's uh, middle of the night in China, so he apologized obviously for, for this discussion, but we have father of this uh, technique, uh, Jose Pachon, we have uh, uh, Roman and, and Tolga and Dan, so we have all major players here except of Jan, so we, we can start discussion. There, there are still some <coughs> questions from the life case and then uh, regarding uh, location of the of the ganglionic plexi, <coughs> so we can we can maybe start if if you don't achieve enough AV nodal denervation in, at, at this point, would you consider a superior left superior GP? That's probably for Dan, where he did this uh, ablation in sweet spot and then close to uh, close to mitral annulus and then in uh, coronary sinus osteum. So would you go for left superior GP? 
You are muted. You are muted. Off, you are muted. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah, it was exactly what we did uh, today, because after the transmission ended, we rechecked the uh, extra cardiac vagal stimulation again, and that, uh, it, there was no response by pacing uh, right, right vagus, but still there was some prolongation of AV without uh, loss of conduction, but some prolongation of AV during left vagal pacing. So as a last resort, we went uh, to the area of uh, superior left ganglion plexus and uh, after a cluster of lesions, let's say you know, 180 or three minutes, um, not three minutes, I would say, the, the three deliveries, uh, uh, 30 seconds, so 90 seconds, uh, that was uh, complete, that we achieved the fi final effect. So uh, I commented before that uh, it is, uh, plus minus 5% of patients which, which need uh, ablation of this side, but this was exactly that patient. I have a question now for all of you, because uh, there, there was one, uh, one comment that in the history of AFib ablation, there was no randomized study comparing ablation to sham procedure. Why not start this time right and do sham comparison? Who believes, who of you believes that we need sham procedure if we have such a nice uh, strategy to, to check uh, vagal denervation. Uh, so each of you can, can uh, have some response. <clears throat> Let's start with Jose. Uh, the, I think the, the sham procedure is very important. However, in this field, it is not as much ethical. I have uh, strong questions about the ethics in a sham procedure because it is necessary to put the patient in the lab to, to do, to make it the, the transeptal puncture, to ablate the compact muscle without ablating AF nests, to prove that there was no denervation. And in another patient, we have to do the same, but ablating the AF nest and the ganglionated plexi locations. So I think it is not ethical. I think it's better to do a comparison between two courts of patients. One, one court with, for example, cardioneuroblation and another court with pacemaker. I think it, it will be more ethical. So the, to do a very real sham procedure in the cardioneuroblation for vasovagal syncope, I think it is not ethical enough to do in human beings. Tolga? <clears throat> uh, actually, this is a really important question. I, I think that if we talk about vasovagal syncope cases, some authors, especially for syncope authors, discuss that uh, there is a clear placebo effect in any uh, intervention in vasovagal syncope cohort. So they believe that we need a sham control because they uh, explain this is happening uh, pacing cohort. In the first pacing study, we saw a significant effect by using rate drop response pacemakers, but then we now know that there is no effect, uh, almost no effect after rate drop response pacing. So this is the cause of this uh, problem. But I think that in patients with sinus bradycardia or AV block, for example, in our court, we usually perform this procedure in patients with persistent AV block, and then we follow these cases by using uh, prolonged um, whole term monitoring, and we didn't see any AV block episodes, so we don't need any sham or something like that, or in any sinus bradycardia case, if you don't see any sinus bradycardia after the procedure during follow-up, you don't need to make a um, sham control study. But I, I don't know, but I think that for uh, guidelines, we may need a sham control study, but this study will be a very small case number will be enough with a very small case number. But if you ask my idea, I clear, uh, you see the results. So I, for me, there is no need for a sham control study. Roman? Uh, I agree with uh, Tolga and uh, Professor Pachan because I think the placebo effect uh, may play an important uh, role uh, in a reflex syncope. 
And uh, there is a still important question, but um, I think uh, and uh, agree with Professor Pachon, it's unethical to propose sham procedure to a patient. Dan? Yeah, I have, no, I have nothing to add. I fully agree with, of course, there is a significant ethics uh, issue and uh, we have objective measure and we may even improve the monitoring of patients, uh, let's say via implantable loop recorders. Uh, I think it, it is enough. If, if there is a uh, com complete elimination of all these bradycardias. For, for me, for instance, sham procedure for renal denervation was appropriate because the first the procedure is much simpler, less uh, risky, and uh, that there was no such a nice uh, uh, measure of uh, effect. But here you have measurable effect. So if you have measurable effect and you have 95, 97% uh, uh, success rate in uh, whether it's AV block, sinus bradycardia, or syncope. There is no such a study with pacemakers, with uh, drugs that would document such a high efficacy. So I, I really feel that it's uh, truly unethical. And uh, I, I always ask people who propose this, would you like to be participant in such a trial, if you would have recurrent syncope or if you would have atrial fibrillation, would you like to participate in a trial with a sham procedure to have a risk of a left uh, uh, atrial procedure just for fun? I think it's, uh, it's really an ethical problem. Actually, I would <laughs> like to share another interesting point. For example, in the last year, we did uh, almost 50 cases by using virtual proctoring. I just checked the uh, electrograms and 3D mapping data in my computer, and uh, we did this procedure in all around the world by using first-time users. And they said that there is no syncope recurrence. How we can explain this response? For example, I don't share just my cases. Uh, th there is a question whether these uh, lesions could be pro-arrhythmic. Any, any of you can answer. I have, I have published, I have just published um, uh, uh, a study in circulation uh, showing that in 83 patients followed by uh, two years, uh, more than two years, there was no uh, pro-arrhythmic effect of the cardioneuroblation. We compare the, uh, the, the, the ventricular premature beats, the atrial premature beats, the pulses, and the uh, ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia. And, the, and there was no induction of the arrhythmias with a very hard statistical comparison. There was no increase in arrhythmias because this issue was very important for us since the beginning. So the, the induction of the arrhythmias is, I think it's very rare in, with, with this methodology. I think it is very safe in this issue. However, we have to take care about the induction of EV block. It's obviously because any ablation in atrium uh, may induce EV block, but there, with this, a kind of uh, care, it's not uh, observed the, any induction of arrhythmias in our experience. Anybody wants to also touch this topic? Uh, anybody? Of they, yeah, uh, the, uh, in our cohort, there are no, there are three or four patients with uh, asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. But I think this is not because of cardio, uh, uh, prior cardio neurulation. This is unlikely. I would, I would expect, if it is very extensive, uh, I would expect some sort of atrial tachycardia. And we have uh, no single case of atrial tachycardia in, in, in our cohort. There, there is another question whether it isn't better to have residual effect via the plexi, as Vivek uh, yesterday uh, underlined when we were talking about uh, PFA and possible effect on, uh, on uh, ganglionic plexi. So he mentioned that uh, they may have some role, they may have some reason. So if you denervate completely, there might be some side effects. So this, this is a question. Who wants to touch this? 
actually, uh, according to animal experiments, a partial denervation may cause some problems because uh, actually in surgical GP ablation uh, cohort, we usually see some um, problems with related to uh, partial denervation because after partial denervation, you can see some neuronal fiber regeneration. But if you if you can achieve complete vocal denervation, you will not see a, such a response. Um, actually, we know that, uh, actually we believe, in the first time we believe that these GPs are located in some epicardial pet pet area, but it is not true. In animal experiments, yes, we see that three epicardial pet pets uh, uh, are related to this GP site, but in human, we saw that the great majority of uh, this epicardial ganglia are located around uh, atria, left atria structure. So I think that by using endocardial ablation, you will not see a problem with uh, ganglia ablation. So if I may ask, there is another question for anybody, uh, whether it's possible to use carotid massage for testing cardioneuroablation effectiveness or whether there are any data uh, how it uh, does affect this. If I can answer you, of course, it can be used, but it should be positive at the beginning. If it is negative, if there is no no uh, bradycardia at the baseline, it, it's useless uh, for testing. I would yes, have. I think the same because carotid message may be one of the additional elements uh, to the evaluation of the denervation, but uh, um, only in the case uh, if the previous asystole or bradycardia. Uh, yeah. um, uh, occur. Yes, I, I, ablation. I. I agree with. I agree in this in this issue because. I have been using the carotid sinus massage in patients indicated for treatment of a hypersensitivity of carotid sinus. Uh, and in this case, it is very usual for us because it is possible to see a very long asystole before the procedure and, the, and after this, there is no more asystole even in the follow-up, in the long follow-up. I think it is interesting however during the procedure obviously we do uh, like uh, which early said the extracardiovascular stimulation that they think is absolutely important for to have the the the, the hard outcome the, the hard end point and after this during the clinical follow-up the carotid sinus massage is very important in this uh, in this uh, issue in this cohort of patients there is another question about whether there is a commercially available uh, stimulator uh, for uh, uh, pacing in jugular veins. The uh, stimulator is being patented in Europe and the United States, and I think probably in, in a few months it will be possible. However, I think uh, for now, it is possible to do the stimulation by using an electromyograph and a, a grass stimulator. I think it will be uh, enough for some uh, for several services. So uh, I think at this moment there is no commercial uh, the, the 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 stimulator is not available. Okay. I have another question for Tolga. It was a very nice case as you showed for this congenital heart blocks, but uh, generally I saw that the first case, I believe, was that you also, besides uh, improving AV node, you increase the heart rate. Uh, and uh, my experience with these patients is if you put a pacemaker uh, and increase heart rate, there is very poor tolerance of this. So they are used to have a very low heart rate, and if you, whatever you do, and increase the heart rate. So my question is whether this is different if you do it by pacemaker which is not a, a common, but may happen, or whether, whether it's, how was tolerated the increased heart rate in your case for the congenital heart, AV yes. block? It's it a great question, Peter. Actually, I changed a little bit my procedure uh, after saw some uh, three or four uh, symptomatic stunning tachycardia cases. Actually, um, we usually think that right superior GP is important for sinus malaria, but if you extend your lesions at a little bit upper part, 
for our Tosperio and Kawajiki, you, you, you will usually see very uh, significant uh, increase on heart rate levels. So uh, I, I am trying to achieve um, just 90% um, of pre procedural atropine response. And I usually uh, stop the procedure uh, in uh, 100 BPM heart rate level. And after the uh, follow-up, you will usually see a little bit decrease on heart rate, for example, from 100 BPM to um, 90 or 80 BPM levels. So it will not pose a significant problem related to sinus tachycardia. So in AV below, for AV below cases, actually, it is not easy to say which area is sweet spot for uh, AV nodal conduction. Because in some cases, we saw that posterior media, in great majority of cases, posterior media left cheek or around coronary sinus is important for AV node. But as I mentioned in my slide, in some cases, you can only see this uh, AV conduction response in right superior GP site or in uh, martial track GP site. So in human, there is a very complicated interconnection be between different GP sites. So I think that we still uh, need some uh, experiments, some well-designed experiments in human, but it's not easy. It's not easy. So I think we need to uh, perform stepwise ablation and check maybe i don't use extra cardiac vagal stimulation i certainly believe that there is a clear theoretical background of this technique but by using extra cardiac vagal stimulation you may also perform very large ablation in some cases because if i check my port in av block cases i didn't see any uh, recurrence in any paroxysmal av block cases and i didn't use extra cardiac vagal stimulation and you usually perform a very limited ablation in very limited areas. So I, uh, today, I don't know uh, what is the best strategy, but all techniques have some limitations, I think. Let, let me say something about this, OK? Of course. Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, I think the, abla the ablation for treating um, AV block is more difficult than uh, sinus node, because uh, the AV, AV, uh, AV node is uh, located in, in the center of the heart, so it receives innervation from many places, and it, there is uh, important variations between patients. So for us to do the ablation, to do the treatment of a functional AV block, you use it to control the procedure with left vagus extracardiac stimulation. I think it is very important for us because there is no uh, 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 available map to found the innervation of EV node. I have been doing several testing and it is necessary to have an important uh, way to control the, the innervation. So you use it to stimulate the left vagus and to see the uh, disappearance of the vagal effect, of the uh, effect of the left vagus stimulation. I think it is very important for us to treat the, uh, the AV blocks, the functional AV blocks. And I have found no very extensive uh, ablations with this kind of procedure, because we stopped the procedure as soon as the Vagal effect uh, uh, over the AV node disappears. I think it is very, very, uh, uh, very useful for us. And there is a question, how do you compare atropine and neurostimulation, advantages and disadvantages? If you use atropine, you may test just once. And after that, you eliminate, if, if you use the atropine, uh, intra uh, uh, during pro during the procedure, you you can do this only once. Uh, after that, you will el eliminate all the vagal responses, all the all the effects, or or you are lost. So it can be uh, used, used. It can be used either for indication of the procedure. If that you want to check if there is still enough level of parasympathetic denervation, or let's say in. I, uh, at, uh, at outpatient uh, uh, during checkups after, but we don't do this regularly because we wait until if there is or if there is not a, any clinical event. So 
I did it a couple of times, uh, and uh, even after one year, uh, there was complete non-responsiveness to atropine uh, in some patients, not, not in all of them. Otherwise, there is usually like weaning of, of the of the denervation effect, and it is it is, it is good uh, uh, as well because uh, if some if the patient uh, shortly after uh, cardioneuroblation feel the really faster heart rate, it may be pleasant to all of them. Uh, first of all, there is there is beaning of, of this effect after one month, three months, even one, one year. There is a decrease of heart rate, and second fact is that the, they are adapted to this. So if they feel uh, the, the relative tachycardia at the beginning, they don't feel uh, they don't, don't feel anything after one year. So it, it's uh, I in in our cohort there was only one uh, girl with, uh, with uh, which uh, who who was uh, temporarily on beta blockers uh, uh, and there were no significant uh, complaints about uh, sinus tachycardia. Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with Charlie and uh, there is uh, some points I think are important because for us the atropine is important if you have some doubt about indication of the procedure before the procedure. And it is important also to have a preview of the result of the procedure. I think it's important. During the procedure, the use of atropine is complicated because it will be used the only once. So it is not a good... Uh, we, we, we use it at, in, the begin, in the first study because there was no uh, extracardiovascular stimulation in that time. And I, I think if you, during the procedure you have an increase of the sinus rate, the reliability of the atropine test is reduced. So it is not a good solution in this scenario. And I, I have been using also the atropine in the, uh, in the long term for study patients in ambulatory environment. If you uh, suspect that there was a recurrence of the innervation. I think it is important. Well, I, I have comment. I, I'm always uh, trying to figure out why uh, this uh, type of procedure um, is not uh, yet accepted by many who do ablations because uh, we, we all have patients with uh, vasovagal syncope. We all have patients with functional bradycardia and AV block. And we all do uh, catheter ablations, and uh, I met people who really uh, always tell me I, I don't believe this, and that there is no rationale for this, and and they do ablations of every other substrate. So, uh, w what is the reason uh, that th this strategy or this uh, technique is not yet accepted uh, as well as other? Uh, strategies of ablation. I, I cannot figure out why is that, although it has been described already a long time ago and we have these patients and, and they, they are treated uh, unsuccessfully with a pacemaker implantation and still it's not uh, coming and, and we had problem even to that there was no mention in guidelines, uh, European guidelines. I was reviewing guidelines and there was no single sentence about this. And when I insisted, and Piotr Kulakowski from Warsaw also insisted uh, as a reviewer, they put finally these two sentences that basically said nothing, that it exists, but it has no rational, it, it, it shouldn't be done. So uh, this, this really surprises me. I, I cannot figure out why is that. Actually, if you look at the single guidelines, there is no data for anything. It is not the same with AFib guideline or heart failure guideline. If you look at midodrin or fluidocortisone, please look at the data. There is only 20 cases. They divided these cases into two groups, and then they found something like uh, results, and they that said that this is a randomized controlled trial. This is also true for all other techniques like physical counter pressure maneuvers. We are talking about physical counter pressure maneuvers, but please look at the uh, case number in that studies. So again, Guidelines says anything about uh, cardiointerative younger cases. There is nothing because there is no randomized controlled trial demonstrating any positive effect of pacing. So 
Uh, we yes, I know this is uh, our cardiovascular publication, our uh, observational studies, not randomized controlled trials. But for single guideline, I think that it's clearly uh, enough to get a class two B indication because there is no alternative. We saw such a clear response, so I, I think that the guidelines written by uh, single uh, story pacing authors. So this is why we didn't get any uh, indication in the la latest guideline. But I think, I hope that it will change in the next guideline because we will have some more data, but and importantly, uh, we can achieve some of these authors. We can explain the technique in some meetings like this one. So I think it will change in the next guideline. So that was my question, what we should do together to change this situation, because uh, th this is for me unacceptable. Everybody who can see the results, uh, sees the results. So th there should be some, some movement forward. We should talk with unbelievable, uh, unbelievable uh, <laughs> person. Non-believers. Non-believers, yes. Non-believers want, yes. But, uh, Carlson, I think the, this, uh, this is a real work but we are on the way. I think the, the work, the studies developed by Charlie, by Toga, by Roman, uh, will we, change the, the guidelines. I, I'm absolutely sure about it. However, it takes time. Uh, uh, recently, we have a book that was published by Dr. Brignoli, my friend, Dr. Brignoli. And we know that he is completely dedicated to pacing indication. However, in this book, he included a sharp only for cardioneuroablation. So I think it's the first book with a sharper with cardioneuroablation. I think the situation will change in a medium future, like basically on the work of these authors and the work uh, and the meetings like this one in Prague. Hopefully. I think, I think that the guys from Grochowski Hospital should uh, finish their uh, randomized study, publish it, and it will be the next step. And the, like, we are thinking and uh, uh, currently designing a new study uh, similar, uh, randomized, like conservative and cardio uh, strategy uh, uh, and com uh, this ILR uh, for follow-up because it will be like more, more firm uh, confirmation that there is, uh, the cardio ablation is effective. Yes. Like, uh, like the Roman study. Yes. The Roman study that will be very important. Yes, uh, and we hope that our study, uh, which will be announced, um, I hope, next year, uh, will change maybe a little uh, the guidelines, but uh, we still uh, need more data, but the data are still growing. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So anybody it, has a comment? Uh, we are sure. getting close to the end of the debate or time for debate. So anybody wants to say something uh, like final thoughts or because there are no other questions? <clears throat> Dr. Pashon, Jose, so say something. <laughs> yes, yes I, I would like to, to thank the, your, your organization, the, the Prague meeting organization that it, it, I think it is extremely important because I, uh, we know that it is one of the most important meetings worldwide, and the, including the cardioneuroblation is very important for the technique. I would like to thank you, to thank with Charlie, Roman, Toga, uh, and I have to work hard in order to, uh, to go on with this uh, development of this uh, procedure. Thank you very much. Okay. I think it was nice, uh, nice words. For, uh, th these were nice words for the for the uh, end of this session. I would like to thank all of you for presentations, for cases, for nice discussion, for participation. I hope that we meet uh, in the near future uh, in person 
somewhere, if not uh, in Prague uh, next year or in future years. And uh, this also brings us to the end of this uh, Prague workshop edition 2021. As I mentioned, we changed the name or we try to change the name to Prague Rhythm and we will use then 2022 or, or 23. And um, I hope that we, we also learned uh, how to organize uh, online meeting. And my vision is that next year, if it will be possible to meet uh, in person, we will combine we will be kind of hybrid hybrid meeting. So there will be some pre-recorded cases, some uh, live cases, maybe lectures will be pre-recorded because it's much easier to handle. And then discussion like this will be very nice, uh, you know, together. So we, we got a lot of inputs uh, during this online meeting. And we also increased the number of faculty members. And I, I believe also that next year we will have more technologies, especially there will be more cases of uh, pulse field ablation, which will be game changer in, uh, in uh, electrophysiology for future. So I, I'm very positive about, uh, about future. And uh, I would like to thank all participants. If somebody is still watching or will be watching, I would like to thank all teams in uh, Homolka and Prague uh, ICAM Hospital. I would like to thank also to organizers of uh, this meeting, uh, CCL company, uh, Hanka Klimentova, who is uh, the person in charge, also to technical staff here in ICAM and also uh, this TV broadcasting group, which works with us all these 23 years. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention also the sponsors, because without their support, we could not organize such a meeting and uh, I hope that they will support us uh, also next year and um, see you in Prague next year again in April. Thank you.